There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. How to love your children. It would seem that that ought to be the most natural thing in the world, that we wouldn't need to be taught, but we do need to be taught what love is. And according to 1 Corinthians 13, we find out that it's not feelings. It is not a mood. It is not a temperament. It is most certainly not a matter of genes. And God help us all, it is not a matter of a glandular condition. Love is action. And it says in Titus 2, verses 3 to 5, that the older women are to teach the younger women to love their children. Now I want to say to every woman in this room, you are an older woman. I don't care if you're 16 or 20, or 70, there are younger women looking up to you. I remember very clearly how it was to be a nine-year-old girl, and my next-door neighbor was Ruth Ritchie, who was 15, and to me, Ruth Ritchie was an older woman. She was full-grown, adult, everything that I aimed to be. I wanted to be I wished I could be as beautiful as Ruth. I wanted to do my hair like her. I wanted to dress like her. I wanted to walk like her. And I'm sure she had no idea that I was scrutinizing every move she made and every word she said. And somebody probably is scrutinizing every one of you. So I don't want anyone to feel that they are exempt or exonerated from these commands in Titus 2, 3 to 5. Now, I have no doubt that Paul was thinking of the older uh, mothers and grandmothers in his in the churches that Titus, as a young man, was to teach the older women to take the responsibility for teaching these younger women. Titus couldn't do it. He was a young man. What did he know about how to love your husband and how to love your children? So Paul delegates, teaches Titus to delegate the authority to the older women. Now, I hope that that is being done in this church and in wherever, whatever churches you're coming from. But even if it is being done faithfully from the pulpit, you probably need another reminder, too. We all do, don't we? Reminder after reminder. But I find it very sad as I travel around the country and find that older men and women are looking forward to retirement as a time when they can do exactly what they please. They can get themselves an RV and they can play golf and go to Arizona or California or something. And of course, I'm from the East and that's the the great ambition of everybody to get out to these wonderful sunny places and just lounge and relax and go on cruises and go back to the, go to the gym maybe. Um, I don't know if I can find this little poem that I have here. Ah, yes. It's called Today's Grandma. In the dim and distant past, when life's tempo wasn't fast, Grandma used to rock and knit, crochet, tat, and babysit. Grandma is now at the gym, (laughs) exercising to keep slim. Now she's golfing with a bunch, taking clients out to lunch, and all she's going north to ski and curl, and all her days are in a whirl. Nothing seems to stop or block her now that Grandma's off her <laughs> rocker. <laughs> it's funny, but it's also tragic that I meet younger women wherever I go who tell me that there are no older women in their churches who are taking Titus 2, 3 to 5 seriously. Even when they ask them, they'll say, oh, well, you know, I really, I wouldn't know how to do that, and I don't really know the Bible well enough, and I'm not very spiritual, or I don't have time. Or they say, yes, I'll be glad to do it, and then they don't. 
And when I ask older women, how seriously have you thought about those few verses? How much have you prayed that God would show you the older, the younger woman who needs you so desperately? I had the blessing of many spiritual mothers in my lifetime. And I think of Amy Carmichael as one of them. I never met her in the flesh, but I met her through her books. But there were many spiritual mothers who, whom I did know in the flesh who were there when my own mother was not there because geographically my mother wasn't there or something. And I know that my mother mothered a good many people besides her own six children. It's a very serious responsibility. But when I see the way children behave in churches, the way they behave in grocery stores and in airports, my heart breaks because there are so few mothers and fathers who really seem to know how to love their children. And the Bible says that if you don't discipline your children, you hate them. The father who does not use the rod hates his son. That's strong language. Now, the world would tell you exactly the opposite, wouldn't it? The father who uses the rod hates his son. The Bible says the father who doesn't use the rod hates his son. Eli suffered because he had never once asked his sons, why are you doing what you do? He was another wimp, just wimped out when it came to fathering. David lamented, Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Oh, Absalom, my son. I would God I had died for thee. And you are going to have to die for your children. Die to your own desires. Die to the desire to be out doing this or that or the other thing, crocheting or exercising at the gym or taking clients out to lunch. It takes sacrifice on the part of both fathers and mothers to be parents. And that's another thing that I see as I look back from this perspective of all these years on what my parents did for us. My mother was always there. She never was anywhere else. Almost never. She went shopping very rarely. She almost never went out to lunch. She, my parents didn't go out in the evenings. They were there with us kids. And I'm not saying that it's wrong for you to go anywhere ever, but I, I just am so grateful that my parents were there for us. And my father never went off with quote, the boys. Never, once, do I know of my father going off with the boys. He did belong to a bird-watching group. I, I'm not sure if it was all men. It probably was men in those days. Uh, but that didn't last very long. He, he had been bird-watching himself before anybody ever thought of that phrase, and he could imitate 60 different species of birds to absolute perfection. I was just listening to his tape this last week with my granddaughter's tapes of those wonderful bird calls, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Anyway, Saturday afternoons, my father took us someplace. He was with his children. He would take us to museums. He would take us on walks in the woods. He would take us to the beach. But he gave his Saturday afternoons to his children, and his evenings, almost always, he was at home. That's one way to love your children. Now, how does God love us? That's our pattern. And the definitive passage would be Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. You have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. Have you ever been tempted to say, why me, Lord? Next time that really silly thought occurs in your mind, just remember that much worse things have happened to much better people. <laughs> Put that in the back of your mind someplace. Why me, Lord? The, the sensible question would be, why not me? You know, Who do I think I am that I didn't deserve this? If we got what we deserved, we'd be in much worse trouble than any of us has ever known. And it has nothing to do with deserts. God disciplines those whom he loves. So you can thank God that whatever this discipline that he is bringing into your life is, it's out of his loving heart. He cherishes us. He yearns over us. He longs for our 
love and our trust and our companionship and our obedience. The Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. It doesn't say work through your feelings about your hardships. It says endure them. Very straightforward, very simple. To me, working through your feelings sounds the most complicated thing I can even imagine. I mean, it, it sounds like an awful waste of time. An utterly fruitless exercise in futility. So why bother? Why not just endure hardship as discipline, seeing in it this truth, God is treating you as a son. For what son is not disciplined by his father? Unfortunately, a lot of them are not nowadays. But any good father disciplines his son. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children. The word in some translations is bastards, very straightforward. And not true sons. Which do you want to be, illegitimate or a true son? If you're going to be a true son, you will be disciplined. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. That's his purpose, that we may share his holiness. That's always the answer when you're saying, I don't know why this is happening to me. There's the answer, in order that you may share his holiness. And the, thing that, the hardest thing is to see in whatever it is, whatever form. Now, God is not going to trust very many of us with huge and heroic kinds of suffering. Most of God's dealings with us comes through the little things. He comes in the little things in order that we may share his holiness. In order that we may share his holiness. That's what it's for. Your suitcase doesn't come. What is God saying to you in that? Plans that you have cherished disintegrate. What is God saying? He is disciplining you for your good. Now, please don't ask me, but I don't see how this thing that has happened to me could possibly be good. All I can tell you is, God's word says it is. Nothing happens to you that isn't for your good. Nothing at all. Romans 8, 28 says, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose, and his purpose is that we should be conformed to the image of his son. To share his holiness is what it says in Hebrews 12.10, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now, my mother pointed out that you train a child long before you teach him anything. Just as you train a horse, you don't reason with the horse. You don't explain why you're putting this thing in his mouth and holding these, putting these reins on his back. You simply do it, and the horse gradually becomes habituated and does whatever it is you want him to do by means of that bit and that bridle. And the same thing is true of the child. It is utter foolishness for parents to be reasoning with teeny tiny little children who couldn't care less what the reason is. They don't like it, that's all. They don't care what the reason is. They don't like it. And so you simply have to get them to do what they don't like and to obey your word. Now, I said in my earlier talk that my parents were under the authority of the word of God. And certainly, they established unequivocally that their word was final to us children. We were taught the authority of the word. When you see a parent telling a child to do something, not once, but two or three or six or ten times, or telling the child to do something and then saying, one, two, three, four, what are you telling the child? You're giving him a clear message that he may delay obedience. 
If you say, if you repeat a command three or four times, the child has been taught by the parents that they do not mean what they say the first time. They don't mean what they say the second time or the third time or maybe the fifth time. They never mean what they say until they start screaming, at which point you might get a spanking. Let's face it. It's the authority of the word that God uses for us. He does not beat us over the head with a big stick. He gives us his word, and he gives us the choice to obey it or disobey it. Now, if we don't obey it, Jesus said, you will never get out until you pay the last farthing. Please don't ask me to explain that theologically. Jesus was using a metaphor that every last one of us understands. There is going to be a comeuppance. There will be punishment. God will do whatever he has to do in order to bring you under subjection. But you want to teach your child to choose the right thing, don't you? Of course you can force him by brute force. If you tell the child, as I saw poor harried mother sitting in the airport with me when I was waiting for luggage, this was several years ago, she had little Jennifer, who was about two years old, and little Jennifer was climbing on the carousel, the luggage carousel, which hadn't been turned on yet. And there sat her mother next to me. Jennifer, come back here. Jennifer, come here. Jennifer, I said, come here. Jennifer, get off that thing. That is a luggage carousel. They're going to turn that on. You're going to get hurt. Now come over here. I didn't count the number of times, but what happens next? Jennifer doesn't budge. She doesn't turn around even to listen to her mother. She's still playing on the carousel. Whereupon, her mother gets up and goes over and picks her up physically and brings her over and plunks her down on the bench beside us. Jennifer has been taught that the word means nothing, that her mother will do for her what she doesn't want to do. You understand? Now, I wanted with all my heart to turn to that mother and say, you can teach her to come the first time you say it. Now, I didn't know this woman, and maybe I should have talked to her. I don't know, but I didn't. And I find myself in that position again and again and again. If your child is seven months old and has just learned to crawl and can crawl to the coffee table, pull himself up, and pull your royal Dulton Fulton figurine off the coffee table, you have two choices. You can childproof your home, move everything out of his reach, or you can teach him no. Now, if you, do, if you choose the former to childproof your home, what are you going to do when you go to your grandmother's? What are you going to do when you go to the grocery store and he starts pulling stuff off the shelves? What are you going to do when you go in the card shop? I was in a Hallmark card shop. Here was a woman pushing a baby in a stroller. This woman was so preoccupied looking with the cards. You know what the baby was doing down there, pulling the cards out, spreading them all over the floor. Do you know what that mother said to that child? I was just appalled. She turned around and she said, oh, Jeffrey, do you see that lady back there? If she sees what you've done here, she's going to get mad. What is she teaching Jeffrey? Nothing at all about respecting other people's private property. Nothing at all about the word no, but just, you don't want to get hurt, do you? She might get mad at you. Do anything you can do as long as you can get away with it, but there's a lady back there. She might see you. It's tragic. The older women are to teach the younger women to love their children. And my parents taught us that our love would be expressed in obedience. And the obedience had to be immediate. Delayed obedience was treated exactly like disobedience. It wasn't good enough for us to say, oh, I was just going to. And I can still see little Evangeline running out into the patio when Valerie went to get the stick and holding her little behind and saying, I don't want a panking. <laughs> it was too late. She was going to get the spanking. Now, please understand the very great difference, the great gulf fixed between child abuse and spanking. If you repeat the command five times or ten times and your voice gets higher and higher and louder and louder, you are going to lose control. And at that point, you are going to be angry 
and you might very well abuse that child by the way you administer that spanking. A spanking is administered by a parent who is under control, who speaks in a normal tone of voice to a child and speaks only once and has already explained to the child, if you do not do what I tell you, you will be spanked. And if you start that, when the child is, let's say, seven months old and he moves toward the coffee table and he puts out his tiny little hand toward the royal Dulton figurine. Now, of course, I would not recommend that you use the royal Dulton figurine in this learning stage. <laughs> I mean, it put, but put something on the coffee table that you don't want him to touch. Anything, but just something. And when he rip, his little hand goes toward the thing, you just look him in the eye. This is point one. Look him in the eye. It's no good being over here at the sink doing something and yelling at him over your shoulder. If you need to, it's probably a good idea, get down on your knees, look him straight in the eye, and say no. And he knows exactly what you mean. He understands that word from the time he's about six weeks old, probably, if you've started saying it to him. And if he touches it, then he gets a spanking. Just a little spanking, but enough to make him cry. It has to be a measure of pain, measured, administered, lovingly, and deliberately by a parent who is under control of himself. Now I saw a wonderful illustration of the effectiveness of this method, even in a child whose parents did not have clue, number one, how to do this. This young couple was having dinner with me and a couple of other people, and my heart sank when I saw them arrive with their one-year-old at the restaurant. I hadn't known that this baby was going to be along. And I love babies. It's unfortunate that very often there is no possibility of adult conversation if there is a baby or an animal in the room. <laughs> it completely scotches all possibility of any kind of continuity. So this was supposed to be the kind of a dinner in which we were going to be discussing important things, and here was this one-year-old. Well, my heart sank a little bit further when I heard the mother say to the father, oh, is that the only kind of a high chair they've got? It was one of the ones without a tray that sits at the table. Oh, she says he's going to be all over the table. <laughs> well, she was right. He said, they put him at the head of the table. I was to his left. His mother was to his right. And it wasn't 10 seconds before he reached for her fork, and she took it out of his hand and put it back. And he reached for her knife. She took it out of his hand and put it back. He reached for a spoon. Then he reached for her water glass. And he reached for her wine goblet, her plate, everything within reach on that side he reached for, and she's talking the whole time, just talking and looking away and just automatically. Then she began feeding him crackers. Then she asked the waitress to bring him a glass of milk. She kept trying to do things to distract him because she'd been taught, I'm sure, that it's very damaging to a child's self-image if you say no. You don't want to give him a negative self-image. And so she didn't want to say no. She physically kept restraining him. But, of course, it was a continuous process, very distracting to everybody else. This went on for about 15 minutes. There were slight intermissions as he wolfed down the saltines. But then, guess what? He reached for my spoon. <laughs> now, this child had never seen me before. And as far as I know, as far as I could tell from the demonstration we just had, nobody had ever said no to him before. And I just put my face right down. I just leaned down, and I said, Jeffrey, no. Just like that. And he just went. Pulled his hand away, looked thunderclouds at me, and looked at his mother and reached for her spoon. <laughs> now, of course, I was hoping and praying that the message had gotten across. That boy knew, what did he know? That one-year-old had figured out months ago, these people never mean what they say. They don't say anything. They, they, I can get away with any, any murder. Whoever this person is over here, she means what she says. And he did not make a move toward anything on my side of the table until close to the end of the meal when he thought, I'm going to try this one more time. And so he reached for my glass, 
and all I had to do was look at him. <laughs> and once again. <laughs> now, I'm sure he, that little boy hated me, but that's how simple it is. You know, Nancy Reagan's motto about drugs, just say no. I mean, think of the energy that you will save. Think of the peace in your home. Well, it, it, somebody has to teach the younger women to love their children. And I was talking with the, a young woman, who, a woman in her 40s who has five children now. And she brought up the subject of my mother. And Robin had sat under my mother's tutelage in a young woman's Bible class and had visited my mother individually so that she could learn some things from this older woman about raising children. She had one baby, and she went to visit my mother when this baby was seven months old. And as she sat with the baby on her lap, my mother sitting in her rocking chair, the baby was pulling Robin's glasses off again and again and again. And Robin was just taking his hand away and I don't know doing what else, but Robin said, you know, your mother changed my life. She said to me after the first few times, Robin, did you know you can train him not to do that? She said, I didn't know that. I had no idea I could train a seven-month-old not to touch. And she said, your mother told me how to do it, and she said, it, it has shaped our family life. And when I was there for dinner, I could see the order and the peace in that home because here were parents who established the authority of the word. Now, if you didn't start when the child was seven days old, which I would recommend, or seven hours old, and there are ways of doing that, and for your information, there is an excellent course taught by Gary... Ezo, is that the name, of Grace Community Church. I met them just a few months ago, and I had been recommending a book called My First 300 Babies, which I certainly strongly recommend, but they tell me that the author of that is a Christian scientist, so I'm not allowed to mention that anymore in my radio program, which seems to me rather a uh, button-down kind of a mind, but I have to obey the people that are over me on that subject. I didn't find anything in the book that was objectionable or that even gave me a clue that the lady was a Christian scientist, but it was, it's full of wisdom. But since I can't recommend that, let me recommend the Ezos program. <laughs> it is wonderful. And uh, it, it just deals with day one from the day you bring the baby home from the hospital, you begin to establish the fact that you are in charge of this home, not the baby. And all of us have seen homes where the newborn baby is in charge of everything. The entire schedule of the family has to revolve around that tiny little human being. If you didn't start that soon, if your child is already two or four or ten, I wouldn't say that it's too late in the sense that there is nothing you can do now. Of course, it's going to be more difficult. The later you start, the more difficult it's going to be. But I do want to give hope to those of you that think, oh, might as well forget it, I've done it all wrong. God will help you. And one of the things you can do if your children are, let's say, three or four, is to go home and say, honey, mama learned some things today. <laughs> and we've been doing some things wrong in this house. And we are going to start over. And this is the way it's going to be. When you disobey, when I speak to you, I will only speak once. And if you don't obey me, you have chosen a spanking. It's amazing how simple that is. But the child needs to understand that he has a choice. He either obeys or he gets a spanking. He may make his choice. And so when he disobeys, then you say, you give him the spanking, and then you take him on your lap, and you hug him, and you love him, and you say, I love you too much to allow you to disobey me. And you chose a spanking. And it'll gradually sink in. In Psalm 119, verses 51, and for quite a few thereafter, we have a wonderful illustration of the authority of the word. 
Psalm 119, verse 57. You are my portion, O Lord. I have promised to obey your words. I have no doubt that it has been far more easy, far easier for me to obey God and to trust his word because I grew up in a home where my parents meant exactly what they said. Much easier for me than for people who didn't grow up in a home like that. So if you didn't, just pray that the Lord will help you to start now and to start over. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. Are you ready to be changed? Willing to rearrange your life? in order to conform to the will of God. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. That's verse 67. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Meekness says, teach me. Teach me in any way I need to learn, Lord. If it's through suffering, if it's through somebody else, somebody else's word, if it's through my own failures, whatever it is, any experience of weakness where you know you haven't done it right, you know you can't do it by yourself, you know you're a miserable failure, every experience of weakness is God's voice calling you. And I love that phrase that we sang in the beautiful hymn, Be Still, My Soul. The waves and winds still know his voice. The authority of the word. Remember when Jesus stood up in the bow of the ship and spoke to the wind and the waves? And the wind and the waves always obey him perfectly. The tide obeys him perfectly. The bats obey him perfectly. The clams obey him perfectly. They do exactly what bats and clams and tides and winds were created to do. But what about you and me? We disobey because he gave us the choice. He gave us a choice because he wants us voluntarily to love him. Voluntarily to obey. And if a faithful father and a faithful mother faithfully deal with a little child, that child is going to love them, respect them, honor them, thank them with all their hearts. My brother Phil wrote to my parents when he was in the army in World War II in Europe, and he said, thank you for teaching me to obey. And that story is in my new book, The Shaping of a Christian Family. It's the opening chapter telling about my mother's discipline of my brother Phil when he was two years old. And he said, thank you for teaching me to obey. I've never spent any time in the brig. Because in the army, you either obey or you're locked up or you're given some miserable job to do or something. There will be punishment. Teach me your decrees. It was good for me, verse 71, to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. Verse 75, I know, O Lord, that your laws are righteous, and in faithfulness you have afflicted me. And, of course, the whole psalm in every single verse speaks of the word, statutes, precepts, judgments, law, the authority of the word of God. If you love your children, you will establish your authority. You will teach them responsibility. And the first person to whom they must be responsible, of course, is you, because you stand in the place of God. To you fathers, again, I say, you have the most solemn responsibility because God will hold you responsible for the training of your children. The Bible doesn't say, fathers, let your children grow up. The Bible says, fathers, bring up your children. That is an act. That is constant, daily faithful, obedient action under the authority of God. You must teach them responsibility. Teach them to choose rightly, and that is to be a responsible adult. Teach them, for example, to take responsibility for their own bedrooms. Any little child who can walk can pick up his clothes. 
there is absolutely no excuse for a little child living in an absolute chaos and of a pig pen. Oh, well, he's too little. Maybe he can't reach the hooks to hang them on, but you could provide him with a little stool so he can climb up and hang them, or you can hang them up for him once he picks them up off the floor. But there's no excuse for not teaching them. Now, it's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, and training a child really comes down pretty much to nagging, doesn't it? saying the same thing over and over and over again. I would hope not in a tone of irritation every time. We do get upset with them when we've told them 10,000 times, don't leave the cap off the toothpaste, don't leave the lights on, don't leave the water on when you're brushing your teeth, pick up your shoes, pick up your clothes. It's a temptation to all of us to just get so disgusted because they don't listen. How do you think God looks upon you and me? I mean, here I am, 65 years old. How many times has God had to tell me the same truth? He has had to tell me countless thousands of times. And I'm still a fool and slow of heart to believe. And the disciples who spent three years in intimate contact with Jesus, walking with him, listening to his, talking to other people, hearing every word, and he said they were slow of heart. So let's remember, don't throw in the sponge, don't give up the ship, just remember God has been patient with us. Ask him to give you patience with your children. They can pick up their toys. There's no excuse for their leaving their toys out. There should be a time in the day when everything is up off the floor. Clothes, towels, dishes, they can pick up dishes. And it's possible, I think, to organize the clearing of the table. If you have several children, you get the smallest child to pick up the silverware. Won't hurt if he drops it but he can pick it up off the table perfectly well. He can pick the napkins up and put them back in the drawer if you use cloth napkins. And then the next child, one child picks up the dishes, and the oldest child probably is the one that has to pick up the fragile things or the glasses. But just a little organization which takes thought and time and persistence and faithful teaching, but it will pay endless dividends. How about leaving bikes outdoors? How about thoughtfulness? Parents who love their children will teach them thoughtfulness. And the basic principle behind a Christian home is my life for yours. The principle of sacrifice. These parents are giving themselves, giving their lives to their children. Now, if anyone nowadays were to have asked my mother, what do you do for yourself, just for yourself? I don't think she would have had the slightest idea what they were talking about. If they had said, you mean you just live for your children and you're always at home? She would not have understood the question. And if they had then concluded, well, that means you don't have any life of your own then, do you? My mother would have said, what? No life of my own? Here are my six children. They are my life. These are my gifts from God. That was her life. She didn't need anything else. Did Mary mind that she was going to be known for the rest of human history as somebody's mother? She was willing to give up her plans, her engagement, her reputation in the town. How was she ever going to prove to anybody that she had not been unfaithful to her fiancé, Joseph? Her instant response was, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it happen, as you say. Meekness. Whatever you want to give me, Lord, I'll take it. And if God gives you children, there is no higher calling than that of a father and a mother. The world can't even come close to anything as precious as the privilege of shaping the life of a child. And I read a very interesting secular article 
about women who had been in the high echelons of big business, women who were CEOs, women who were making millions of dollars, who were going back home, all of a sudden realizing that they had missed out on the only thing that really matters in life. And to those non-Christian women, suddenly something clicked in their minds, I want to be a mother. And one woman who had raised her own children and then had gone out and got herself a very lucrative job said, I'm going back home and be a, a nanny because she said, anybody knows that there's nothing so fascinating as children. And I've raised my children, but I'm going to take care of other people's children. And one young woman to whom God didn't give any children for a very long time, she prayed that the Lord would show her what she could do for somebody else's children. And that young woman sat down to her sewing machine and she sewed clothes for Valerie's children. She'd never met Valerie. But she wrote to me and asked for Valerie's address. Pouring out oneself as the principle of the cross, my life for yours. That's what Jesus did for us. And you know, none of us is worth anything at all to ourselves. We are totally worthless to ourselves. But we can be worth a very great deal to God if we respond to him in faith and to other people. So forget about this self-image stuff and just pour yourself out. Thoughtfulness is taught to little children, not by using big words like, big words like sacrifice, that is such a frightening and daunting word, but by just saying at the table, you pass the butter to daddy first. Why? In order to be able to say, you're more important than I am. My life for yours. Tiny little thing, and if there are five cookies on the plate and there are six children, what do you do about that? Who is going to be the one that is willing to say, I won't have one, thank you? Now that takes an advanced course <laughs> in thoughtfulness. Do you slam doors? Slamming doors, thundering up and down the stairs, shouting from room to room, it's not thoughtful, it's selfish. If you love your children, you teach them your authority, you teach them responsibility, you teach them thoughtfulness, and above everything else, you teach them to love God. And you teach them the verse that says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for, and I like this modern translation that says, this is the best thing children can do to please God. Obey your parents. One little boy who listens to my radio program heard me read that verse. He had, he had been a fan of mine, his mother wrote to me, until he heard me read that verse, children, <laughs> obey your parents in the Lord. And he said to his mother, that's not in the Bible. Is that in the Bible? And she said, yes. He said, turn that lady off. <laughs> well, that's just a few, I trust, practical, down-to-earth suggestions about how to love your children. And for every, all of you who don't have children, Ask God to show you what you can do for other people's children. Ask God to make you an instrument of his peace, perhaps to another family, to a Christian family. And you singles especially, you have a very special place. And I would love to get you to read Amy Carmichael's biography to show you that here was a single woman who became a mother to literally hundreds of Indian children. And that's all. Lars has given me my time signal. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today. And will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms.